welcome to our special edition of Knowing Neurons. I'm Anita and I'm here in conversation with Dr. Shekhar Saxena, who is the director of the Department of Mental Health and Substance Abuse at the WHO. Welcome Dr. Saxena and I'm happy to speak with you today. Thank you very much Anita and I'm very happy to be here. Uh, thank you for giving me this opportunity. Oh, it's our pleasure. So let's start a little bit about your profession. So your career has taken you from being a psychiatrist all the way to being a policy maker at WHO. Tell us a little bit about your journey. How did you end up being a policy maker at WHO? Uh, and it's a first a correction. I am actually not a policy maker. I am a staff member of WHO. So I advise countries on policy. Okay. But they make the policy, not me. Okay, okay. Corrected. But uh, yes, you are right that I am in the area of uh, public health, I am in the area of uh, policy and uh, yes, my career began as a doctor, then as a psychiatrist and uh, as a psychiatrist, I was uh, looking after people for their mental health problems one after another and here uh, as uh, a policy person, I look at the whole systems and I advise countries one after another not individuals but policy makers and, and the scope is very different because obviously uh, you can make a difference for each and every person who has a problem but sometimes the system requires change which is more difficult to do but will benefit a much larger number of people. So I started uh, as, a, as a practicing psychiatrist and as a teacher, mm -hmm. but then I got myself involved more in research for policy and then actually for policy. And that's brought, what brought me to WHO. And I must say that I miss clinical work, but I'm very happy to be doing what I'm doing now. Yeah, was there a defining moment that prompted your decision to address mental health on a global platform? Uh, no, it was a gradual change. I started working on the on the uh, research for policy and the implementation science that brought me in contact with the, the people in WHO. I contributed to some of the projects, then I coordinated some of the projects, and then they thought that I will be uh, I'll be contributing if I came to Geneva working for WHO full time. I tried for two years, I liked it, then I stayed on. So yes, it was a gradual, slow change, but a massive one, definitely for sure. Yeah. And how does a typical day look like for you? The days vary a lot. Uh, sometimes I'm traveling, I'm uh, anywhere, any part of the world. But let me just begin with uh, when I'm in Geneva. I have a lot of communication with uh, policy makers and researchers and even civil society partners. And so I do receive uh, a number of communications, mostly by email now, which actually arrive more at night because of the time difference, many of them coming from the western part of the world. So my initial couple of hours are spent in reading, responding, and sometimes saving for further responding. But then I have a number of uh, meetings with my colleagues here. We plan how to respond best to the country's requests. I plan some documents which uh, provide guide for policymaker. I uh, chair some meetings of, uh, of partners who happen to visit WHO. And then of course, I supervise a number of people who are making a difference on individual and specific aspects of mental health, like depression, like suicide prevention, like uh, psychosocial assistance to people who are refugees, mm -hmm. emergency mental health, and so on. And I must say that sometimes uh, very uh, unexpected things uh, land up uh, on my desk. Mm -hmm. And these are sometimes things that my DG requires, some specific country requires help in a few hours. So it's very uncertain, but, but I, uh, I respond many times to emergencies and but I try to find time for more uh, mature planning okay. which, which I do. This is my day in Geneva. If I'm elsewhere then my partners and hosts decide what I do and that could be very different mm -hmm. from attending meetings in the ministry but also then visiting sites where some projects takes place uh, in very remote areas which I actually enjoy very much. 
What is one thing about your profession that makes you smile and makes you feel fulfilled? Uh, difficult to answer, but uh, maybe. It's when people who are outside mental health area who talk about mental health with the passion that I admire. So that makes me really, really happy. As mental health profession professional, it's my job to talk about mental health. But when somebody else does, for whom it is not a given, it's not their duty, I feel really, really happy. And what's something that keeps you up at night? A very slow change that is taking place in the area of mental health. What we need today happens in 10 days, in one month, sometime in two years. So I think uh, I'm restless. I'm impatient. I need change more quickly because we are lagging behind in mental health compared to other areas of health. So that's what keeps me awake at night. How to make the change much more quick and rapid. Yeah, we're going to dive in a little bit into mental health and social stigma now. From your previous interview with the NPR, I remember you mentioned when it comes to mental health, all countries are developing countries. And that's a great perspective. So I was wondering, what is the common denominator for mental health being such a universal phenomenon? Mental health is a part of health and health uh, is a great priority. Uh, It should be uh, one of the first priorities for any society and for any country. Uh, Mental health problems are there in communities and countries that are small or large, poor or rich from any part of the world. Mental health problems uh, affect people at all ages of both genders and at any strata of society. So it is actually a universal phenomenon. But when I use this phrase, to say when it comes to mental health, all countries are developing countries. What I specifically mean is that the needs are definitely there all all throughout the world for all countries, but even the response falls short in all countries. So when we talk about the economic development, we say there are some developed countries and there are some countries that are developing. Imagining or believing or assuming that developed countries have developed. Now, that is not the state any country has reached for mental health in any part of the world. They are all aspiring to become better, but they haven't got it still. So that's why I say that all of the countries have to make uh, further attempts. They are all on a journey towards better mental health for their citizens. But if you ask me if any country has got it completely right, the answer is none. So that's why I say when it comes to mental health, All countries are developing countries. I have a question about social stigma and mental illness. So I have a lot of neuroscientist friends and you think that we do better, but I can still feel the presence of social stigma when it comes to brain disorders. So how do you typically address the issue of stigma up front? Stigma is something that pervades the area of mental health at all levels, from individuals, from families, in the communities, in the countries, and also, unfortunately, for mental health professionals and researchers, but also for policymakers when they talk about mental health. So this is uh, really uh, a very widespread phenomenon. It's not true that it's only in developing countries, it's in all countries. How do we handle that? I think the best way to to handle stigma is to bring it out in open, to be able to talk, to be able to discuss, to be able to plan together, to be able to respond together. And that is the key to reducing stigma. If it comes out in open and people don't uh, feel that it's something that needs to be hidden, that needs to be talked in hushed tones, that is where the anti-stigma program starts. And I think the community leaders and influencers have to begin that process. The common man will not do it unless he or she sees a good example of somebody he respects or admires. And so we we respect the people in in the area of uh, uh, either leadership in any any way, uh, a politician, uh, a sitting parliamentarian, an artist, a painter, a writer, a sports person, when they talk about mental health, it really affects a lot of people. So we are all looking for more disclosure, more discussions by people who influence the public opinion. Yeah. And with respect to the family, 
I think family members and friends have some kind of a role as well, because here's an example. When we hear of physical injury, you know, our families and friends, they're like, oh, go see a doctor. But when we when we hear of mental injury, like trauma or anxiety or depression, the immediate response is that of you need a vacation, go shop or things like that. It's never really go see a doctor, get some medical help. So um, how can family and friends intervene better when they know of a loved one that's going through a mental setback? Well, uh, one of the issues to be clarified is that there are mental health problems which uh, can be small and minor and transitory, which can be solved by the person himself or herself or with uh, advice from family, from a friend or from a religious leader or anybody else who the person respects. But then there are also mental disorders which are much larger than just day-to-day mental health issues. And, and that's where we need professional help. The differentiation sometimes is difficult because we say, I'm feeling sad today. That's not depression as a disease, but if it lasts two weeks, it is sustained, it affects our our functioning, then it could well be depression as a disorder, as a mental disorder. That's where we need help. So family and friends, in fact, that's a good uh, occasion for me to introduce the topic that uh, uh, next year in April, on 7th April, World Health Organization is going to have the World Health Day which will be devoted to depression. Mm. Uh, every year, WHO has a day, a World Health Day, which is devoted to, to a, a, a different theme every year. And next year, in 2017, it's going to be on depression. And our key message is, let's talk. Yeah. When you think you have a problem, let's talk and then see what is needed. So family and friends have a great role in that. There are some material on our website already that you can refer to. Yeah, I think I saw the YouTube video of the big black dog, which addresses depression really well. Yes, that's one one of our uh, very often watched video. In fact, uh, it has surpassed all records from, uh, from WHO. It has done 7 million views and it keeps going up. So we are very happy and proud of producing a product that people really like to watch and can benefit by. Yeah, we're going to embed that video as a part of this interview so that people who come to our website can also have a look at that video. I have a quick question about a pattern. So uh, is there a pattern you observe in societies when you travel across countries that has prevented us from openly discussing issues like anxiety or depression or worse, it prevents us from seeking help for it? Well, uh, there is obviously the the factor of stigma that we talked about earlier, but also there are other factors. Things like if you are anxious or depressed, it must be your own fault. That's a misconception. That's a myth that is around. And that prevents from people to take uh, take help because they think they should be doing something about themselves. Uh, Or uh, sometimes a myth that it is all in the mind and it's not real. We want to emphasize that mental health disorders are real, as real as any physical disorder. So that's something that is a key message of our public education campaign around mental health problems. Are there any lifestyle changes that you think can either help prevent or at least reduce the risk for mental illness? Oh, sure. We can do a lot. In fact, uh, self-awareness, looking after one's stress level uh, and also leading a life that keeps our stress level under control uh, are key factors for uh, promoting our mental health and protecting us from uh, undergoing uh, mental health problems and disorders. In addition, there are a couple of other factors. One is the abuse of alcohol and drugs or any other psychoactive substance which definitely increase the chances of uh, mental health problems and the other uh, factors are having good and effective social contacts if you're isolated we are more prone to get mental uh, problems and if we have a good and robust uh, uh, social circle uh, of friends family uh, these are really really good protective factors lastly uh, a lifestyle which is uh, which is more uh, regulated in, in some sense, uh, for example, getting good enough sleep and having uh, food at the regular time, 
having uh, not too many uh, unplanned activities are generally uh, better for mental health. Although I'm not saying that they should not be done, but only in moderation. Yeah. We're going to change gears a little bit and have some fun questions to learn more about you. So here's mm-hmm. the first one. Who are you most inspired by? Uh, I'm inspired by many, many people. So it's really difficult to identify one person. Uh, one person I really admire is uh, Arthur Kleinman in Harvard University, who has been my teacher remotely, right from my early career. And he has done more for global mental health than many other people, uh, I would imagine. If you weren't at WHO, where would you be? And what would you be doing? <laughs> Uh, again, difficult to answer, but I would <laughs> perhaps be uh, helping people with their mental health issues uh, for individuals and families. I would still be a clinician looking after people who need help now, uh, although I'm doing that now, but also from a very different perspective. When you aren't working, which I'm sure is very rare, but when you aren't working, what would you be seen doing? Well, I do take time off because as I was advising earlier, it's good for everybody's mental health. So, yeah, when I'm not working, I'm I'm reading, but also I'm walking. I'm a very keen walker and I live fortunately in a country like Switzerland, where it is enormously pleasurable to take a walk near the lake, on the mountain, and, and admire the natural beauty, which is actually mentally very healthy. Yeah, there are a lot of studies that actually correlate physical fitness or just physical activity to better mental well-being. So yeah, that's a very good practice. And we now have some really quick rapid fire questions. So this is where you answer the first thing that comes to your mind. And it's really quick and easy. So here's the first one. What do you prefer, tea or coffee? I prefer coffee. If there's one piece of advice you could give your younger self, what would it be? Uh, think about think about others and do something which will benefit the society. What's a hidden talent in you that the world is yet to find out? Photography. I I am a keen photographer and I uh, I take photos of unusual things like uh, the art on walls, which people sometimes call graffiti, but I don't. And I enjoy going to new places and taking photographs of uh, uh, of what people write on walls. That's amazing. You should have a blog, maybe, so people can find out about that. If if you feel like doing that in later later life, maybe. I need some advice on that, but yes, (laughs) I I think I should do that. What's your favorite book? Uh, uh, There are just so many. But there are certain books I can read again and again and again. And one of them is an old Indian scripture called Gita, which is really fantastic. You discover new things every time that you read it. Is there a place that you want to visit that you haven't been yet? Uh, there are many, many places I want to visit. So, yes, I, I'm sure there are many. But one thing which I really want to do is to take a long and leisurely drive through South America, mm-hmm. uh, spanning many, many countries. I think that's, an, that's a region that I'm less familiar with, but I'm very keen to take a three, four weeks drive along the, the region. If you had a superpower, what would it be? To know their priorities in their mind and to be able to challenge them. That's really thoughtful. And finally, you have a seminar on mental health wellness at the Society for Neuroscience annual meeting in San Diego this year. It's on Saturday, November 12th at 11 a.m. What can students learn from attending your session at SFN? I expect that students as well as other people who attend will be able to get a better idea about the challenges in in global mental health and also what they can do wherever they are, whatever they are doing, what they can do to contribute to facing these challenges all over the world. Yeah, I think we'll see you there. Those are all the questions I have for you, Dr. Saxena. Is there anything else you'd like to add? No, I think you've covered a lot of ground (laughs) and I'm very pleased with the kind of questions that you asked. Okay, thank you so much. It was my pleasure speaking with you. Thank you so much. It was fun. Thank you. (laughs) Okay, bye. Bye Bye-bye.